Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. I was actually kind of hoping it was going to pour rain while during the meditation. That would be cool. <laughs> One Breath at a Time, Buddhism and the Twelve Steps, and A Burning Desire, Dharma, God, and the Path of Recovery. A longtime Buddhist practitioner and 12-step participant, he's a leader in the Mindful Recovery Movement and one of the founders of the Buddhist Recovery Network. Welcome back, Kevin. Thank you. Very nice to be here to see you guys. I uh, obviously looked a little smaller this morning, understandably. Um, before I get started on my uh, main topic, um, I wanted to share something. That if I don't know how many of you got up early and, and read any of the New York Times this morning, but they had an article about posture in the the week in review, and it was particularly about the posture of people like this walking down the street. And, but it was really applicable to our meditation posture. Uh, and, and, you know, studies showing that there's sort of uh, the mind states that you're, when you're in this posture, that you're not as clear, that you don't have as, your memory is worse, that dep- there's more tendency to depression, and which reminded me of my own, you know, struggles as an adolescent when I, around the time I started to get depressed I also started to walk like this and um, you know I had one spiritual teacher who used to encourage me to look up when I was walking down the street and I still do that and I know I can really notice distinctly when I'm walking like this and then I remember oh look up how differently it feels and of course in in Buddhist meditation I suppose in any meditation we teach people to sit upright and it can feel sort of sort of awkward at first. Certainly for me, I still in my meditation will often wind up like this, and I, and a lot of my the things that I remember in sitting is like, oh, I need to sit up, and just noticing the energetic shift is so interesting. Because I, I literally, when I was a kid, as a teenager, I thought that walking around upright wasn't cool. You know, it just represented something kind of like stiff and, I don't know, right wing or something. (laughs) Military is what it was, you know, in the 60s, I think, probably. And so, like, being like this was like, you know, that that, that attitude. And and it's just so interesting to see, wow, it's it's not just um, something physical, that there's a mental component to it. so uh, I don't I don't know how I thought of this. I know it was a day or two ago uh, when I thought of this topic I wanted to speak about today. I'm not sure how it came up, but uh, this is um, a traditional Buddhist teaching 
uh, called the realms of existence. And um, so I want to, I'll start just by kind of outlining the traditional view of it and then talk about the application to our own understanding of our own experience. Um, so the, the realms of existence, uh, there are said to be six realms of existence. So this comes out of, uh, it, it's in the Theravadan school. It's also the, the Tibetans and the Mahayana talk about it. In fact, in the Tibetan Tankas, when you see the wheel of life, they show the different realms. That's one of the things that's depicted there. So the, the six realms, uh, there are two that we can see that, that there's nothing uh, mythological about them necessarily, the human realm and the animal realm. And then there are two considered lower realms, a hell realm and the hungry ghost realm. And, and uh, the hungry ghost realm is particularly one that gets talked about a lot in the recovery addiction world, but then I'll, I'll talk about that. And then the kind of higher realms, although one of them is not so great, that which is the jealous God realm, and then the heaven realm, or realms. And so, you know, there's there's other versions where they break this down into multiple heaven realms and multiple hell realms, but, uh, you know, six is enough to... <laughs> so the, the traditional teaching... And the, uh, very often when you're introduced to Tibetan Buddhism, they'll talk about these realms and they'll say the human realm is the ideal realm for, to find enlightenment because there's just enough suffering and not just enough comfort that you, and awareness that you can, uh, you're motivated uh, to change and to grow spiritually and you have enough... Uh, wisdom and intelligence to to pursue that whereas in the higher the heaven realms although you have the clarity and intelligence you don't have the motivation because there's no suffering you know, like what why should I <laughs> become enlightened when I'm already uh, experiencing pleasure and in the lower realms from the animal realm on down there's not enough awareness you can see that animals might be motivated to have enlightenment because they're, they experience suffering clearly but they don't have the consciousness that we have that allows them to, to um, grow in that way this is as far as we understand and perhaps there are enlightened dogs <laughs> Um, and there is a there is a Zen koan on that topic, isn't there? Does does dogs have Buddha nature? So, uh, I'm not a Zen practitioner, so I can't tell you the answer to that. I think it's something like, Ooh. and the Zen master says, "Good, excellent, you're enlightened." Okay, um, sorry, well, there are not any serious Zen practitioners here. Right? <laughs> And so in this traditional teaching, you know, where you are is a result of your past karma. Right? So if you're in a hell realm, you, know, you, you deserve to be there. And, you, and, the, and, and the hell realms, well, first of all, all of the realms are impermanent, right? You live in them for a certain period of time. This is one of the things that distinguishes uh, heaven and hell in Buddhism from the Judeo-Christian and Abrahamic version of it where I guess you go to heaven and you're there forever um, in the Buddhist version you go to heaven or hell but eventually you come out uh, unfortunately at least in the hell realm unfortunately it's a long time like 60,000 kalpas and that's like you know they say like a kalpa is the amount of time it would take and then they have these crazy things like that. If a you know a bird had a a uh, cloth in its mouth and it flew over Mount Everest once every hundred years and swept the, the cloth over the mountain, the <coughs> num the length of time it would take for the mountain to be completely worn down that's a kalpa. You know, so that's, <laughs> you know that's going to take a while. Okay. Um, 
So it's a long time when you go to these hell realms. And the same with the heaven realms. So one of the problems is that you get in there and you don't see impermanence. This is the other, another advantage of human existence, that our life is impermanent and we can see it. We know, we see aging and death. In the, in the heaven realms, apparently, you're just hanging out and it's just great. And it's like a whole bunch of kalpas and it's like, wow, I must... It's all good. I don't have to do anything to grow or, or uh, make anything better. And then all of a sudden, somebody, psh, you just disappear. And so, oh, what happened to Joe? I don't know. You, turns out that they, you know, they went back into a lower realm. You know, this is mythology, right? This is this is, and it, and it, you know, finding teachings like this makes you realize, in some sense, that the way Buddhism is sort of portrayed in the West as this sort of very practical, down-to-earth, there's, it's not a faith-based religion, it's, it's very selective. You know, uh, it, there's a lot of mythology in, in ancient and traditional Buddhism. The, what's, but with, as with all mythology, there are, there are teachings in it. And I think this is one of the flaws in our era in terms of our relationship to religion that, that we wanted to, we live in a very literal era and we don't sort of understand that a couple thousand years ago when people didn't understand science they explained things through these metaphors and through these uh, and imagery and mythology and it, I don't I don't think it was so much that they believed that that was a reality as that that was a way of of just holding it because the human mind wants to have a way of understanding things. So, because when we don't have any way of understanding things, we're fearful. So we kind of go, okay, well, you know, there's a god up in the sun, and you know, and it rains. Where there was a flood, so we must have done something wrong. And they kind of, you know, make up these stories. But uh, you know, in in our era, we kind of have the people that just accept this stuff verbatim who want to tell us that, you know, the earth was created 6,000 years ago. And then we have people who go, oh, well, that's just silliness. Obviously, the, uh, you know, there's no meaning in that. That's just, that's just uh, you know, uh, ignorance. And instead of sort of going, well, is there something we can get from this? Though? Is there something it's pointing to? So the, the realms of existence are a great example of this because they point to aspects of our consciousness aspects of particularly our emotional life and state, states of consciousness so this uh, the resource I used for I went back to, to to look at some of these ideas was this classic modern classic thoughts without a thinker by Mark Epstein uh, he's a a Buddhist uh, psychiatrist and kind of Freudian, uh, and and kind of uses this Freudian analysis of of uh, of the realms of existence, which I, I don't understand everything he's talking about because I'm not a psychiatrist. Um, but he gives us a good some really good pointers to how to understand these realms of existence and see that they're actually part of our own lives and and see somewhat how, how to work with them and, um, and even how to gain something from them, to learn from them. So I'm going to, I think, start from the kind of lowest realm and kind of work, work our way up. Uh, see if I might veer off somewhere on the way. But the, so the, the hell realm and the, and Again, the hell realm, as it's described in some of the texts, sounds like something out of the Bible. It's like these you know, horrible fires and, and ice, ice cold that people are living in. And the, what Epstein talks about is how this represents our most uh, painful psychological states, states of paranoia, of violent aggression, um, uh, you know, tremendous fear, um, anger, and you know it, it made me. It kind of 
in those states, we're completely consumed, right? There's no no space around it. Um, someone's no, it's the coffee. That's the coffee. Yeah. That's lovely. Isn't it lovely? I don't I don't know if that's arousing anybody's craving for coffee. <laughs> or hot water for tea. I mean. Um, so we get consumed in these states, and we've all been in in states like this at least for moments in our lives, and we've been so angry that we couldn't reflect at all on what was going on, when we were so fearful that we were completely lost. Um, and it's interesting that uh, and, and Jack Cornfield talks about how some of these states can arise out of deep meditation states. Uh, and I think this is because our uh, subconscious really gets opened up in deeper states of meditation because the, the normal suppressive mechanism is kind of released. So I had an experience on a retreat uh, about 10 years ago where um, I was a, uh, a week or two into a retreat and I got... Uh, I was very settled in, and one morning, this was at Spirit Rock, it was a big retreat, like 75, 100 people, and one morning during the, Q, during the Q&A with Jack Cornfield, a young man in the back of the room jumped up and started screaming at Jack, and it was you know, completely you know, shocking in this silent retreat, um, and I don't remember what he was saying, but it was you know, challenging him and threatening him. And, and, uh, and clearly something had gotten triggered in him, and he was, you know, someone who was in a hell realm at that point, lost in his own anger, his own fear. But it triggered something in me. And later that day, I started obsessing on the idea that he was going to come back and that he was going to bring automatic weapons with him. And I started to see in my mind everyone at Spirit Rock being gunned down this violent barrage. You know, it was a terrible, terrible state that I, I got completely lost in. And, and it, 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 you know, it eventually passed. And, and a day or so later, I was in an interview with Jack and told him about it. He said, well, why didn't you come to see one of, the, one of us? You could have just come and, you know, ask one of the teachers to talk. And I realized it, that just hadn't occurred to me. You know, I was just so lost in the experience. So it's very difficult to get out of these states, and we can see how consuming these states are in our culture, in, our, in, our, in the news, you know, almost every day, now that people get lost in these states, and that, that uh, you know, one of the great challenges of our, of our modern world is how to help people to, to not fall into these states. And there are entire, you know, perhaps, you know, in, a, in some way, there are even belief systems growing up that, that justify being in these states. And uh, it's something that, uh, you know, we have to really, um, I was going to say fight against, but uh, <laughs> I don't think that's quite the right word, is it? Well, in the... Uh, uh, Mark Epstein says that the, the traditionally the kind of antidote to this, the, the bodhisattva, this kind of wise being who helps us get through these states, holds up a mirror to, to us in these states. And so this, that helps us to see where we are. And it, and, um, it's like when you're really upset and somebody who really cares for you can go, you know, it's okay, you know, settle down, you know, and somebody who can just kind of remind us, oh, this isn't me, you know, because we're in that spell. We have to, we have to uh, really get kind of shaken out of that spell. Um, and I, I would say, Epstein doesn't talk about this, but it occurred to me as I was reflecting on this earlier this morning that that uh, really being severe depression is a very is another hell realm like this being in that state where of despair where there's no hope there's a sense of no hope 
and again, it's kind of that we we really almost need something outside of us to break us out of that. Um, I was I'm trying to think of something more uh, helpful. <laughs> well, maybe it'll come. Maybe you guys have it. Um, I, I, but the but what I will say, and there's two things, uh, two aspects of Buddhist teachings that are really important to. Uh, to all of these realms. One of them is reflected in the title of this book, Thoughts Without a Thinker. Thoughts Without a Thinker is pointing to the kind of not-self or you know, quality. That, that is that these feelings are not me and they aren't mine. They're, and, the, and the other thing, the not-self and then the impermanence, that, that they are not me because they will pass. They come and they go. And and what we, you know, really the antidote to these things is the work we're doing on our spiritual path, and it's it's um, you know the the cultivating of wisdom, the cultivating of loving kindness and compassion. These are the things that protect us from these states, and uh, and and having having the understanding that even when we are falling into some state of fear or, or depression that oh there there is help there's you know there i'm not uh, this isn't uh, all consuming this isn't a real in the sense of something that can't be changed or that's solid and th- and that's uh, i really think the protection for us that um, you know we we maintain that that perspective and and some some element of faith uh, that we can we can reach out from those places for the help we need. So the, uh, it's when we it, it's it's when we and I, and I don't even know if I should say we it's when people uh, can, don't see that there is an alternative that this doesn't that this isn't real, that it isn't something they have to live in. It's when people believe that there's no alternative that they get completely obsessed and lost in it. And they decide that you know, chopping people's heads off is a good way of you know, solving problems. You know? um, and that, and it's, uh, you know, from that point, it's, it's hard to come back, I would have to say. So, the, the next realm up... <laughs> Which is still a pretty bad one. This realm of the hungry ghosts, uh, and this is one of the most evocative of the realms. I would say the most evocative of the realms. It's one that that uh, gets depicted visually. Uh, it's been used in many metaphors. Gaver Mate is a, 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 a Buddhist uh, therapist and addiction researcher. Has a book called In the Realm of the Head. The hungry ghosts. And the hungry ghosts are these beings with very large stomachs and very small mouths who can never get enough. They can never get enough food. Uh, but they represent that need that's uh, insatiable. So, the it, this obviously relates to addiction, and it's a perfect example or just... Um, uh, image for the addict who can't get enough. But we all have these moments, whether addicts or not, of kind of feeling emptiness and of feeling that we're not getting what we need. So the that psychological state of just a state of loneliness or um, disconnection, of feeling uh, that uh, there's no kind of care for you. This is that kind of the psychological version of this state. In fact, um, Mark Epstein talks about low self-esteem as being a kind of hungry ghost. Um, and you know, from the psychological viewpoint, he's, he talks about uh, being obsessed with a past pain. You know, so this kind of can relate to trauma as well, that when, and that we're trying to somehow satisfy some or solve some past issue, you know, that we didn't get, 
and uh, something that we, we weren't given as a child or we, that we, uh, some loss we've experienced. And, uh, you know, again, it's perspective on that. You know? uh, I mean, you need to have that wisdom that sees, oh, that's, that, that's able to accept past loss and, and move on. Um, the the uh, Bodhisattva then brings up what uh, Epstein calls objects of spiritual nourishment. So it's to again see that we're not going to get satisfied by something out there, by a food or a drug or a relationship or a job that uh, that um, we'd have to find that sense of fulfillment of being full within ourselves and that that's something that we have the potential for right? that's, that's another aspect of our human potential that we can find satisfaction within ourselves well the next realm is the animal realm so we can we know this realm and and we this is a realm that we sense in ourselves and we can we can easily you know fall into that realm and I would say that probably every day most of us have some experiences of just being on that instinctual level of just I'm really hungry you know um, or I'm really tired I just need to go to bed you know those things that um, and the 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 um, the problem with the animal realm is that there isn't any wisdom that that's kind of seen as kind of dull and stupid and and uh, you know we all have those moments of dullness and stupidity and um, the it, it you know we can see there's it's this is not that far from the hungry ghost. Um, except that the animal in the animal realm you can get temporary satisfaction whereas the hungry ghost can never get satisfaction but in the animal realm it's always uh, impermanent that satisfaction and, it's, and we have to constantly reinforce it um, and the, the uh, Epstein talks about our kind of fear of being taken over by the animal realm particularly how people can get be fearful about their own sexuality and and you know I see in the uh, in the recovery world that I work in even though I know there's a lot of uh, addiction around sexuality people don't talk about it that much but what I hear more about is their food their relationship to food and their and and one of the things that it looks like to me is that a lot of the relationship to food winds up being fearful that once people sort of get over their, when once they're able to sort of stop using food in an unhealthy way then there's this kind of controlling element it's like I, I have to watch out for that in the same way that people can feel be afraid of their sexuality kind of taking them over so so um Epstein just talks about integrating these things and you know how do we allow ourselves to be sexual beings to be beings who who need sensual pleasure and and want sensual pleasure without those things uh, taking us over um, and again it's it clearly it's it's through inner work that we because that those obsessions are come out of the the lack of of a sense of uh, okayness within ourselves. Uh, I've worked with um, researchers who look at food uh, uh, binging and, and unhealthy patterns of eating. And one of the things that I found interesting is that uh, this particular researcher, Jean Christeller, who's an academic at uh, Indiana State, she says. Um, Normal eaters eat for comfort sometimes. Unhealthy eaters eat for comfort 
daily, you know, every meal is an attempt to, to get comfort, to fill themselves up. But that it's normal. So, so she's not sort of demonizing, oh, I really want some comfort food. You know, she's not demonizing that and saying, no, you can never do that. That's unhealthy. She's just saying, so it's the same thing. It's like integrating. It's like, yes, of course, uh, ha having an active sexual life is healthy. Having a, a, a love of food and, and enjoying it and at times an overindulging, it, that's okay. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure I could say the same about drugs and alcohol. Uh, and some people do try to make those claims and, and some of the less, I would say, less successful treatment programs have said, uh, like the, what was the moderation drinking, the woman who, you know, who, I don't know if she died in a drunk driving accident or she killed someone in a drunk driving accident, but one or the other. Uh, uh, you know, for alcoholics and, and for sex addicts, you know, whatever that is. I mean, that's a really... A, a strange term. I always thought, well, it wouldn't be so bad. <laughs> but anyway, I don't think that what I was getting it really. I mean, anyway, if I was getting laid that often, I mean, it would be. You know, but anyway, that's not the point. Uh, it's the inner experience, right? It's the suffering of the of the hungry ghost that there's never enough. And, and uh, you know, with uh, there are. Some people who just can't drink or use, you know. I know. But uh, with, I think, with the more um, instinctual things like food and sexuality, I think m even people who've had problems with that can can find an integration. Um, so we come to the human realm, uh, and what what uh, Epstein characterizes the kind of uh, essence of the human realm as a search for self or search for our true nature, search for sort of fulfillment as a, as a um, being. Uh, and uh, that's a, I think there's something quite lovely about that. Um, the, we, the thing is that, you know, as, a, as I've been saying, this realm in this realm, we experience all the other realms, right? We experience hell and heaven. We experience the hungry ghost. We experience the animal. We experience the jealous gods. Um, so this is really the realm in which we can integrate all of this. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, what, what makes this realm a, a, such a, a useful one is this capacity we have for transformation. We, we, combining the motivation because we can experience suffering with the clarity and wisdom to transform. So the Tibetan, when the Tibetans talk about these realms, one of the things they emphasize is that you are very fortunate to be born in, a human, in the human realm, and not to waste it. I mean, the Buddha would say the same thing. You know, your time is short; don't waste it. Um, and whether you believe in uh, reincarnation and that, well, if I don't live right in this life, I'm going to be in some other realm, or or you just see it as this is one-off deal. Uh, it doesn't seem like there's much. Uh, you know, point in wasting it. You know, it's it, it is. We we don't have to uh, be religious to realize there aren't many human beings on this planet. Really, you know, there there are a lot more ants, a lot more other beings than humans, and clearly, we're the most powerful beings on this planet and uh, you know our personal responsibility as well as our global responsibility is is vast I mean it just amazes me uh, frankly how humans in just a short period of time have brought this planet to this point of danger you know you, 
you look at Earth, the Earth is pretty damn big, you know. The oceans are pretty darn big, but we've been able to, you know, change the stuff here enough that we might kill ourselves off or kill off all of beings or something, who knows. But that we can actually change the climate, it's, it's really stunning to me. Uh, you know, you, uh, I'm sure that when people started, uh, you know, burning coal, there was, it never occurred to them that, that, that the things that are happening to the earth now could have, hap could have happened just by, you know, heating their house in London, you know, in 1835 or something. It just would have seemed absurd. You know, they didn't even know how big the earth was in some sense. They had, so, uh, it's sobering. Okay, two more runs. <laughs> the Jealous Gods. I, I really like the Jealous God realm because it's so screwy in this way. The je because it's seen as this... Uh, it, you know, again, if you see it as a, kind of a hierarchy, in some way it's above the human realm because these are beings that have a lot of power. But they ain't happy because they always want more power. And they're a perfect metaphor for greed in, in, our, in our world. When, you know, these are the politicians and the CEOs of the world, the hedge fund managers. They don't come here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> the, you know, who, who have everything, you know, the private jet and the, you know, the houses all over the world and, you know, just every material thing they could want, but it's not enough. And, you know, they're, they're maybe they're, you know, Senator, now I've got to be president, you know, and uh, that, that uh, the, uh, this idea that they're, they're like the titans, they're always fighting with each other. Right? I mean, that's exactly that what they do, you know. Uh, I mean, it's a perfect metaphor for Washington. Um, and how crazy, you know. And, you know, and each of us has a little bit of that in us. You know, Annie Lamott, you know, I'm sure most of you know who she is, you know, the writer from Marin, very, very funny writer, and, you know, best-selling author who's been very successful. She, she talks about, like, when one of her friends gets a big book deal and calls her up to, say, to share the good news, and he's like, that's great! That's great! Congratulations! Like gritting her teeth, you know? She's got like this voice that she does great! You know, that's like the phony, I hate you because you got a good book deal, you know, better book deal than I did. And it's like, you're already the famous rock star writer, and you know, but, but yeah, I mean, don't we all have a little bit of that? We're competing with each other and wanting to get a little bit more than our neighbor? Um... Interestingly, uh, Epstein talks about the, that we need uh, a certain degree of this, though. This is a motivation, having a certain ambition. I don't know if I wrote down the word. Um, well, yeah, here's, here's the reference. He says, the Bodhisattva of compassion in this, in this locale, the jealous God realm, wielding a flaming sword, symbolic, symbolic of discriminating awareness. The presence of this sword reinforces the point that the aggressive nature of ego, so that's kind of what this uh, realm is, the aggressive nature of ego is not seen as the problem. This energy is in fact valued and is necessary in the spiritual path. So it's not that we shouldn't have a certain amount of you know, ambition, but that it's our relationship to it. If, if, if that is our guiding force, then and th that's what we're trying to satisfy, then that's not going to help us, or that's going to cause suffering. But if we, if we don't have any ambition, there, there can be this kind of passivity. So it's like to have that energy without it becoming 
our obsession, or our, our focus. Again, again, this kind of integration, right? All these things are kind of have to be integrated in some way, accepted in some way as part of our experience. I mean, even the hell realm, you know, when those states come, I mean, if you've never had a lot of pain in your life, you probably will at some point, you know. I mean, I don't know if that sentence didn't quite say what I was trying to say, but what I'm saying is we all experience some physical or emotional pain severely at some point in our lives. And, and how we handle that, you know, does that become the source of trauma that, that uh, you know, really <clears throat> throws us off our life path or is it something that we can use? Some people are really motivated by suffering to serve others. Uh, or, or to learn how to hold, hold that suffering. So the, the development of compassion actually arises through our own suffering. All right, the final realm, the God realm. Do, 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 do. Uh, and this is uh, that place when everything is, is right in the world, when there's a sense of peace, Satisfaction, those moments of just great joy, the uh, the um, peak experience. Uh, and, uh, the Epstein talks about the dissolving of ego boundaries. So there really isn't it isn't about me in those moments. Um, and and of course, spiritual practice allows us to access these states. I was talking yesterday, I was at the treatment center in Marin yesterday, and talking about how um, people seek after, you know, kind of thrills, like jumping out of airplanes or climbing uh, Half Dome or something. And, the, and when they talk about why they do it, they, do, they usually say something like, I just feel so alive in that moment, you know. There's nothing else. I'm not thinking about anything except just being there in that experience. And I'm always like, you know, <laughs> I'm good with just like following my breath because I can, I can get to that place. Uh, it's not maybe as easy, but uh, it's a little safer. But this is, uh, you know, this rich and valuable experience that people uh, that, that people want and that, that I think... Um, is a really important part of human life. It kind of, it shows us the potential. Uh, and it, and again, it does show us this element of how, if we are, if we experience it with wisdom, we see how attachment to self creates suffering and that letting go of self is, brings this joy and sense of freedom. One of the things that I became aware of as I was working with some deeper concentration states, as I started to do that over the last, well, I started to do that about 18 years ago. I started to work with a particular teacher in the late 90s. And at a certain point, I realized that in those states, there was much less selfing. You know, it, there weren't like the stories about me. And even when I was working hard at it and really engaged in an intensive meditation that it didn't have that quality that sometimes when I'm meditating I'm like, oh, I need to come back to the breath, you know, come on, I gotta quiet my mind. It wasn't that kind of efforting, that the effort was just was kind of egoless. It wasn't it wasn't a, a striving for to satisfy me. It was this natural kind of spiritual movement towards awakening or freedom or letting go. And uh, so this is in these states, this is the place we get to where it just where the the sense of self and the attachment to self and the, even the wish to satisfy self kind of falls away and there's this real freedom in those states. Um, the but they are states, they are impermanent states, and they aren't in and of themselves wisdom. So one of the risks in the traditional model of 
in Buddhist concentration states is that one gets attached to the state because what the Buddha teaches is that the concentration itself is just a tool for bringing more clarity and insight and it's the insight that we're moving towards but if you get attached to the states you don't open yourself up to the insight you just start to kind of try to hold on to the state um, and whether it's you know a vacation in Hawaii which is another kind of heaven realm right just being, or a meditation retreat how we work with the end of it is key to how we benefit from it. Do I come out of that retreat going, oh God, it's over, that was so, I want to go back. Or is it, oh wow, that's interesting, you know, how can I apply this to my life? Come back from Hawaii, it's like, oh God, I have to go to work. Or can we just kind of go, wow, what a, what a gift that was. I mean, I don't know, how do you, how do you it's, it's never easy to come back from Hawaii. You know? I can't give any advice on that, actually. So, I, I think what's, for me, what's useful about these teachings on the realms is this kind of broad view to see that this is, these are a real thing, experiences that I have. And it, what, if I allow myself to get caught up in the states, positive or negative, and forget that they're impermanent and forget that they aren't defining me then I really suffer in them you know, uh, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant there's a, there's a pain that comes around them, that, that attachment and so just understanding oh yes these are psychological states these are part of life and remembering that that key kind of uh, relationship to our experience that comes through mindfulness practice. That's the thing that allows me to move through them just like the seasons, you know, just like the weather. I mean, uh, you know, this... Uh, have you heard anybody complain about the rain lately? <laughs> you know? Uh, isn't it interesting? Because normally when we have weather like this, People are like, oh man, you know, it's so rainy, you know, my basement's getting blah, blah, it's, you know, I got soaked, I can't do this, I can't do, <clears throat> ride my bike, whatever. But right now, we have this perspective, right? We have this broader wisdom about, oh, right, <laughs> this is not, we need this, you know, because I, I remember last winter going, yeah, it's a beautiful day, but this is making me nervous you know it's this isn't, this isn't good I'm, I can't really enjoy this beautiful weather and it's kind of seeing that uh, if you get attached to what well, the best weather is warm and sunny well after a while you realize no you know uh, being in the heaven realm it's not really the answer it's not we need these cycles it's all part of it and, and we can then hold it and, and experience it and not be open, uh, swept away by those different moments. So I, I have, I kind of filled up the time. I know. Yeah. Okay. Where we have to. We have to go. Are you going to be here for a while though for the social yeah. hour? Yeah. Okay. okay. So if you have any questions, you know, please feel free. To just, yeah, I, I, it was going so well I didn't want to interrupt. Oh, you. I'm sorry. Was no, no, supposed no, it's to fine. stop? It's okay. We don't have to be exact every single time. <laughs> do have to I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm not sure which realm that would be, but... Uh. <laughs> I can tell you. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you so much for your talk today. Okay, so uh, announcements. Um, next week's speaker is a gentleman by the name of John Kirk Phillips, who's been sitting Zazen for over 30 years. His first exposure to Buddhism was through Alan Watson in 1968. In 86, he had the good fortune to meet Isan Dorsey, who inspired him to practice Zazen, and was also influenced and guided by the work of Ram Dass. His focus was applying Buddhist practice to death and dying. He's been working as a nurse practitioner at Kaiser since 1998. 
He has studied for 11 years with Darlene Cohen and was ordained as a Zen Buddhist priest in 2009. He's currently a priest with the Spirit Sangha in San Francisco, led by Cynthia Keir. So he'll be here next week. Um, just another announcement real quick is Donna, which is the Pali Word for Generosity. We'll be pa- our host today will be passing around the Donna Bowl. Uh, we ask that you donate anywhere from $7 to $10, um, or what, what, whatever you can give is a real help to the Sangha. It pays for our speakers, newsletters, uh, Larkin Street dinners that we do, any mailers, and our rent as well. So we'll be going ahead and passing that around. And our host today is Jim. We can hear from you real Can I make an announcement? Yeah. Oh, please. Just uh, to let you know, I'm going to be teaching a day-long retreat at Spirit Rock on January 2nd. It's a, one of my recovery retreats. It's called Keep Coming Back, Dharma Recovery and Renewal about uh, kind of getting, if you're in a recovery program or anything else, <laughs> uh, about getting our year kind of started off with a, a renewal of our vow to, to recovery and to spiritual practice. So uh, I have a few flyers if you're interested. This has a bunch of other events out there on it, so please help yourself. Great. Yes, um, I will be, uh, as well as I'm going down the ball. Um, there is hot water for tea. We have a new kitchen. Um, there is a dishwasher, but I think I'm going to do them by hand rather than run the cycle. Um, so just put your tea cups in the kitchen. Um, there's a, um, a sign up sheet, I think. Um, everyone except Steve has been here before. Um, if you want to get on the mailing list um, out there, there's a sign up sheet on the credenza where you're next to the newsletters. Um, Typically, people uh, who want to go out to lunch gather at the door around 12.30. Um, everyone's welcome. I think that's it. Okay, great. Thank you. Any other announcements? No? Okay, the staff for the dedication of merit, please. By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness, which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity, without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.